confess that we have no righteousness in ourselves. We need you. We need to be united to your perfect son, that his righteousness would become our own. We can never express our gratitude sufficiently for the grace that you have given us in saving us, though we were wretched, evil, sinful people. And we thank you, Lord, that not only have you forgiven our sins, but you have also given us the ability through your spirit inside of us to put off our sin, to kill the old man, to mortify him, to instead live in newness of life here on earth. Though our flesh is still with us, though we will still sin, we can become more and more like you. Thank you for that. And please, Lord, now as we turn to your word, purify our hearts, purify our minds, that we would indeed, through your spirit, be more and more conformed to the image of your Son. In his name, we ask all this. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, once again, if you turn to the book of Titus, um, this week we get to start chapter 2 of Titus. And I thought it would be helpful for a second just to review what the book of Titus is about. And I thought maybe it would be helpful to think about the book of Titus uh, in contrast to another of Paul's epistles. Uh, Up in base camp, the youth group, I'm teaching through Romans. Romans is a book that's largely about justification, how we become Christians. And that's one of the main themes of the book. And and Paul gets there by using a lot of detailed arguments. Titus, on the other hand, is written to people who have already experienced the justification described in Romans, who have confessed that they are not good, that they need Christ's righteousness imputed to them and are now regenerated by the Spirit. And Titus is about how those people, those regenerated people, can live good and godly lives. They can be lights in this world. They can be genuinely Christ-like and godly. And given that that's Paul's purpose in the book of Titus, how Christians would be godly in the church, instead of relying on carefully detailed arguments like Romans, the book of Titus is largely a book of descriptions. It's a book full of adjectives, and you've seen this already so far. First, we talked about the the description of the elders, what their qualities are. Then, last week, we talked about the description of the false teachers, kind of the anti-elders. Now, as we move into chapter 2, we have descriptions of who Titus is to be. We have descriptions of of older men and younger men, descriptions of older women and younger women in the church. We have descriptions of how slaves ought to live. Um, And then in chapter 3, we have descriptions of how all of humanity once lived in sin. The book of Titus is a book of adjectives, a book of descriptions. And indeed, the, the specific verses that we have this week it's really, we'll be looking at our uh, chapter 2, verses 2 to 6. And um, just to comment for a second on the structure of these verses, verses 1 to 8 of chapter 2 of Titus, they form something called a chiasm, C-H-I-A-S-M. I don't know if you've ever heard of it before. It's a, a literary strategy, um, structure, that's very common in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And uh, the structure goes like this, that you, the author says something, we'll call it A, then he says something about something else, B, and then he says yet another thing, C, then he says something similar to that last thing, we'll call that C prime, then he says something similar to B, we'll call it B prime, and then he says something similar to the first thing he said, we'll call it A prime, okay? So then as an example, how it works out here is Paul first addresses who Titus is can, is ought to be, He ought to be in contrast to the false teachers. Then he says something about the older men, then the older women, then the younger women, then the young men, and then back to Titus again. And then he talks about slaves. So what we're going to do this morning is we're just going to look at uh, Titus' words to the men and the women. And there are a few things in there um, that we'll leave for next time when we talk about Titus, some general themes, and the slaves. All that being said, let's go ahead and read Titus chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior. 
not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Amen. Um, this passage, it's rather simple. Men and women have different roles in the church. Older people and younger people have different roles in the church. And uh, they have different functions. And to be a godly person in your particular station, you need to know what is particularly required of that type of person. We're not just a homogenous, androgynous mass, as the world would like to present it. That everyone's exactly the same, everyone has the exact same abilities and function and role. That's just not what the Bible teaches. That's not what Titus chapter 2 teaches. And accordingly, that means this passage is very controversial for modern ears, is it not? That we would say that, that women have a different function than men, and that that function um, is that they would do things in the home. They would be responsible for rearing children, that they would submit to their husbands. It's all very controversial. And it, what's remarkable about that is that while this is a highly contentious passage in today's society. This would have been completely uh, unremarkable, completely normal 100 years ago, even 80 years ago. This would have been very straightforward. This would have been, yes, exactly. That's how everyone, every family we know is like this. So before going on and getting into the details of what particularly is the biblical model described, I do want to pause And ask the question, what has changed? Why is this passage unremarkable for everyone from, you know, 6,000 B.C. to 1950 A.D., but all of a sudden it's incredibly countercultural, incredibly controversial? I'd argue the big difference, what, what happened right after 1950, is that hormonal birth control was invented. And then it began being marketed in 1960. That small change that uh, a woman could control her reproductive cycle with taking a pill, highly successfully too, it was a cataclysmic change for families. In an unprecedented way, sex was divorced from procreation. Now, before I discuss this further, I want to take a side note. That does not mean that it is, I'm not saying that it is sinful for individuals in the church to use birth control. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that all of us need to recognize, nevertheless, that it is highly consequential. That the biblical authors were writing in a world where there was no hormonal birth control. And that's a significantly different world. Think of it um, like the invention of cell phones. It's not, of course, sinful to use a cell phone. It's not wrong to use a uh, cell phone. But you should also not be naive that cell phones do indeed have negative consequences. They can have negative consequences on individuals. There's inappropriate ways to use cell phones. And then even at a societal level, we could all recognize, yeah, there have been some negative impacts of cell phones on society. It's the same thing with birth control. It's not sinful for an individual Christian couple to use it, but nevertheless, we shouldn't be naive that there are no wrong uses of it, that there are no sinful uses of it, And furthermore, we shouldn't be naive that there haven't been any negative consequences on society. We shouldn't be naive that we could change something so fundamental to human relationships and that everything would stay the same. Indeed, has the world changed a little bit since 1960? It has. See, what happened is before this, what's ended up being cataclysmic uh, invention, natural forces paralleled the biblical model. It went rather simply. Men and women have always wanted to be romantically involved. Romantic involvement leads to pregnancy. Always the women are the the ones who get pregnant, not the men. And upon the pregnancy of the mother, she then needs to take care of that child. That means she cannot have a career as the man might. And so she needs the father of that child to take care of her and her child. 
The father then, he finds purpose in his life. That responsibility helps focus him uh, in that bearing and raising of children, taking care of his wife. And then it works out for everybody. The man and woman, they get to remain romantically involved. They have more children. It all worked very nicely. Again, this, this benefited everybody. The wife was able to uh, have children, take care of them, be romantically involved with a man. The man was able to be romantically involved with a woman, find purpose in his life. And so because of this, most people followed the traditional model of the family, indeed the biblical model of the family, not even necessarily because of a moral imperative, but simply it was the most efficient system. It's what worked for everybody. And, of course, in, in many societies, uh, especially pagan societies, this natural, traditional model, it, it was perverted, particularly through polygamy and adultery. So then it was really in societies where you had the, the natural forces combining with the biblical vision, the biblical authority coming from God saying this is how a family ought to be, that, indeed, the nuclear family truly thrived, truly flourished. And indeed, I have no hesitancy in saying that is the reason that Western civilization has thrived the way it has, because of the nuclear Christian family at the base of it. And that's not just my opinion. Uh, an atheist, Harvard evolutionary biologist by the name of Joseph Henrich, uh, he wrote a book a couple years ago called The Weirdest People in the World, weird being an acronym, uh, by the way, but he argues for that exact thing. It's the Christian family that made the West the way it was. And this order, though, it was all upended when there was an invention that made it so that men and women could be romantically involved without creating children. This meant that now women needed men like fishing a bicycle, as the famous feminist saying goes. And this meant that men were freed of the responsibility of taking care of a wife and children. They could do whatever they wanted. Indeed, this seemed like a great advancement. Look, women no longer have the responsibility of motherhood forced on them. Men no longer have the responsibility of fatherhood and being a husband forced on them. Everyone can just always do what they want and be self-fulfilled every moment of their life. What was lost in this is that men and women are weak, that that responsibility forced on us is actually a good thing. It purifies us. That demand for love and self-sacrifice makes us put off selfish and sinful desires. And indeed, the consequences have not only affected the nuclear family, they've gone on and on. I believe it's only in a world where romance could be divorced from procreation that there would be the explosion of homosexuality and transgenderism that there is. People already had separated romance from procreation, from the family, and so it was somewhat natural to go into these other sinful and perverse expressions. And indeed, I think that that's perhaps what God is doing in our generation. That's the great theological lesson of our day, is how good and beautiful and blessed God's design of the family was. For thousands of years, everyone just took it for granted. That was all that anyone did. But now that it's been taken away, now that people can somewhat easily live contrary to the biblical model, we now see all the destruction in its way. Can we see how good God was to give us that design in the first place? And remember, this design that we're going to see for men and women uh, it's, doesn't start in Titus. It goes all the way back to the very beginning of the Bible. It goes back to Genesis 1 and 2. There, the focus, especially in chapter 2, is on how the man and the, women, and the woman complement one another. How they have complementary and not redundant, not identical roles. And this is seen in three things. The first thing is that the man and the woman are not created at the same time. Why is that? That's, that's kind of strange. It would have been more efficient. God knows he was going to make both. He could have just had them come out of the ground at the same time. He said, man, this is a woman. Woman, this is a man. Instead, he makes the man first, and he makes the man incomplete and not good, and then he makes the woman. Why does God do it that way? Well, God doing that way, uh, ma making man and woman in that, that manner, he was really continuing a pattern that he had already set in Genesis 1 and 2. We saw it first in, in chapter 1. What does God do? It says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But were the heavens and the earth perfect? No, they were formless and void, and there was darkness. God first creates something incomplete, something that's not good, 
And then a moment later, he makes it good. He gives it form, he gives it content and substance, and he says, let there be light. And in so doing, by not just making a complete thing right away, but by making an incomplete thing and then completing it with the second part, it gives attention to how beautiful and good God's complete and full design is. The same thing then happens at the beginning of chapter 2. Um, at the beginning of chapter 2, there's the world, but there's nothing on it. It's just dirt and dirt and dirt. There's no plants, there's no animals, there's no man. And then it's from that incompletion that God has the rain come on the earth, vegetation comes up, and God brings man out of the dirt. And so by seeing the completion of now having a man taking care of the vegetation, we appreciate more fully God's beautiful design in there being plants and flowers and man cultivating those things. This pattern then is uh, culminated with the creation of man and woman. God makes an incomplete creation of man. He makes man by himself, and he's not good. He's alone, and he needs a helper fit for him. And indeed, it's in that phrase, a helper fit for him, that we see the second uh, thing that Genesis 2 says about man and woman complementing each other. The woman is a helper fit for the husband. Now, when we read that, we often kind of get the emphasis wrong. We think because the word helper comes first that it's the more important description of what a woman is. She's a helper. But that's not the case. If it was the case that the most important function of a woman was that she was helpful to man, then what would have Adam said when, Adam, when Eve was made? Wow, look how strong you are. I've got all these tasks. This is so helpful. Can, could you push that? Could, could you manage this? If, if I just had you take care of the pigs, could you do that? Wow, this is wonderful. We're going to get so much more stuff done around here. This is wonderful. You are so helpful to me. That's not what Adam says. That's not what he cares about. What he cares about is that Eve is fit for him. She compliments him. She is made to meet his weaknesses. That's how she helps him, not by taking care of the flowers and the pigs, but by meeting his inner spiritual needs. And so he says, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This is woman. Finally, we see the, the, the beauty of this complementarity and that for once God says this is very good. Um, the theologian Peter Lightheart, he kind of summarizes this all in, I, I think, a very eloquent way. He says the following, The help the woman provides isn't merely functional or vocational. Above all, the man needs a helper so the part he is can fit into a whole, the union of two as one flesh. Without the helper, the man is as half-finished as a chaotic, darkened earth, as fruitless as land without plants and water. Conversely, woman complements man, completes man as light, form, and fullness complete the formless earth. The gift of the woman transforms the man from a waterless waste into the human equivalent of the garden of God. Yes, Adam needs a helper to complete the human task. More fundamentally, he needs the woman to be fully human. The woman rescues the man from his solitude so humanity can reach its full glory because, as Paul says, the woman is the glory of the man. This technological invention of hormonal birth control, paired with sinful, selfish desires of humanity, has resulted in a society that abhors the beautiful design God made and revealed in Scripture. In its place, they have implemented standards for men and women that are nothing short of destructive. And so as we look at the biblical standards, the biblical vision for men and women, especially in the church, I want to first look at the vision that society has for men and women. And I want to note just how destructive it is. And my goal in this is to, one, recognize the difficulty that many of you experience. It is very hard to be a man and a woman in today's society. They have given us all an impossible, unrealistic, and unsatisfying standard. And it makes it very hard to be a faithful man and woman. I want you to know that you are not alone in feeling that way. Indeed, that's what the society results in. That's what the unbiblical model results in. Second, I want to help you think about the ways that society's destructive vision is affecting you, perhaps. Maybe in your own thinking, maybe in the way that other people view you. And then finally, I want to demonstrate, just plainly, how destructive, harmful, and false society's vision is. 
that the biblical model, God's enduring and everlasting standard, that is what is good, that is what is fruitful, that's what blesses humanity. It's the truth. And so some of what I'm going to say, it is depressing, but it's depressing like the book of Judges is depressing. It's depressing and that it shows what happens when people turn away from God and do what is right in their own eyes. But it doesn't have to be depressing for us. As we follow God's standards in Scripture, we will not be like our society. We will be a city on a hill. We will be lights. We will be blessed. We will be happy. So then let's first discuss uh, the standards for men. In particular, I want to look first of all at society's vision for men. And basically, by discussing society's vision for men, I'm going to discuss the plight of men in America. I'll start first with the poor performance in school and careers of men. Uh, A few statistics. Survey data shows that uh, men are 14 percentage points less likely than girls to be ready to start school at age 5, as well as 6 percentage points less likely to graduate high school on time. Looking ahead at college, young men are 15 percentage points less likely to graduate with a bachelor's. This poor performance in school then leads to poor performance in the business world. Uh, And one huge example of that is the great portion of men who have simply opted out of the labor force. That is, there's a chunk of men who are prime work age, 22 to 54, and yet they have simply opted out of working altogether. They don't have a job, and they're not looking for a job. Uh, The author, sociologist, Nicholas Eberstadt, he outlined this in his book, Men Without Work. Here are some statistics he gives. In early 2022, more than 7 million prime-age men were neither working nor looking for work. That's more than 11% of the prime-age male manpower pool and more than three times the fraction in 1965. So 11% of men in America are simply not working, not looking for work. What do they do? That's the great question. And it hasn't always been this way. Just in 1965, it was a third less. The rates that we have of men not working are significantly higher than even in the Great Depression. And this isn't because there's a lack of jobs for men. Um, Indeed, uh, job openings so exceed the ranks of America's unworking prime age men that every member of this idle army could be placed in a job and there would still be more than 3.9 million jobs awaiting candidates. This is especially shocking when it comes to men who only have a high school diploma. One third of men who only have a high school diploma are out of the labor force, don't have a job, aren't looking for a job. Um, This parallels, it aligns with society's view towards men, does it not? Men are frustrated because they are incessantly told that the very part of them that makes them masculine is toxic, that they are naturally evil, oppressors, and can only be good and acceptable and functional in society should they become effeminate. And this, this hatred, this despising condescension towards men, it's very acceptable in society. There's many examples of this. One is, recently, the Washington Post had an op-ed article entitled, Why Can't We Hate Men? Can you imagine if they ran a headline, Why Can't We Hate Women? How about if, you, if they did a racial direction, Why Can't We Hate Hispanics? Can you imagine if they said that? But men, they can be hated. They can be despised. And so, 46% of American men said that society seems to punish men these days just for being men. This is seen also in uh, the very high rates of criminal activity among men. 73% of those arrested in the U.S. were males. Men accounted for 80% of persons arrested for violent crime and 63% of those arrested for property crime. And then a final shocking statistic in regards to men in crime, one in seven American men have been sentenced for a felony. Men are doing terribly. They do terrible in school. They never, many of them never have a career. They drop out of their career. And a lot of people, when they don't have a career, they resort to criminal activity. Furthermore, if they don't have a job, if they don't have a family, if they don't have any responsibilities, why not risk it uh, in some kind of violent crime? 
And then finally, men are just doing terribly in terms of morality as well. Um, and sure, yeah, unregenerate society, they're going to be immoral. So let's then look at evangelical men. Let's look at evangelical men, that is men who self-professedly say to have been born again and believe in the gospel. Let's look at their morality. 77% of these evangelical Protestant men, of those, 77% of those aged 18 to 22, and 86% of those aged 23 to 32 have engaged in premarital sex. 77% and 86%. 53% of evangelical men have viewed pornography in the last year by their own admission. And let me be very clear. My point here is not to shame men. That's not at all my goal, my point. What I want to do is, is outline, show how destructive society's vision for men has been. Society has said, yeah, men, you don't need to be a father. You don't need to be a husband. You just need to pursue your pleasure all the time. Uh, and there's no responsibility placed on you. And then at the same time, they hate men for being men. This is what happens. Men are not given many opportunities for their natural abilities to flourish. Instead, their natural abilities and propensities are demonized. And on the other hand, their vices are given all the encouragement and opportunity as possible. This is, of course, a recipe for disaster. Uh, the author and professor Nancy Piercy, she wrote a intriguing new book entitled The Toxic War on Masculinity, uh, describing just the ways that men are demonized and attacked in today's society. And she told uh, an interesting anecdote. I heard this on a podcast she was on. Uh, and she told the story of a, a non-Christian sociologist who was pretty famous, and so he went around the world uh, giving lectures on sociological topics. And he kind of had a personal survey game he would like to do. Wherever he went, he would ask men two similar questions. He'd first ask them, what does it mean to be a good man? If a man died and someone was giving his, their eulogy and they said they were a good man, what qualities would that man represent? What makes a person a good man? And people have no problem answering that. They always kind of give the same answers. They say things like they would have honor, integrity, sacrifice, they would look out for the little guy, they would be providing, protective, and they would be generous. He says, okay, very good. And then he follows it up with a similar but slightly different question. He says, okay, if that's what it means to be a good man, now let me ask you, what does it mean when someone says to man up? What does it mean when someone says, that guy's a real man? Well, the answers there are completely different. But again, everyone says the same thing. That means that they're going to be tough and strong. They'll never show weakness. They will win at all costs. They will be competitive. They will be rich, and they will be a womanizer. Are those not the two competing visions of men? You'd be a good man, full of honor, integrity, generosity, uh, maturity, character. Or you can be a sinful, hedonistic man whose whole life is a competition to outdo other people in terms of money and relationships with women. And the definition of a good man that people across the world give, it's basically exactly what Paul says here in Titus chapter 2. Indeed, here we're going to transition to talk about the biblical vision for men. What Paul says there in verse 2 about older men, it's very similar to what everyone knows as a good man. Paul says older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-control, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Sober-minded mean they can make decisions not being clouded by passions and base desires. They can think clearly. They can think soberly. Likewise, they are dignified, they're admirable, they're worthy of respect in the way they live their life. And then thirdly, they're, they're self-controlled. And by the way, this, this word self-control, it shows up in basically every uh, standard that we have for people throughout the book of Titus. So I'm going to discuss that more next time as we look at general themes. It's the same word, though, back in our elder list that I said is better understood as prudence. That is, it's self-control that comes by a person using wisdom to think about the options they have and make the best decision with their mind rather than following their passions. And then finally, it says that men are to be sound in faith and love and in steadfastness. That just basically means that men are to be an example of Christian maturity. Um, that's the basis of Christian virtue throughout the New Testament. Faith, hope, and love. Here Paul says that same thing, just a slight twist substituting steadfastness for hope, but they're very similar ideas. They're synonyms. So men then, what are they to be? They're there to be the building blocks of the Christian community. 
They are to be clear thinkers, respectable, prudent, and demonstrate Christian maturity. They are to be trustworthy and admirable. And of course, a number of these older men, they will especially serve the church by becoming elders. But I also want to note that being a godly older man is not the exact same as being an elder. That's sometimes how it's presented as people discuss the qualifications for elders. They say these are for elders, but they also apply to everybody. Okay, here we go. It's not, though. If that were the case, then Paul would have said with older men, uh, see my previous comments about the elders. They're the same. But he doesn't. He says something else. That is, being a godly older man is not the exact same as being an elder. There are certain people called to be an elder, and there are other people who are called simply to be godly older men in the church, and yet they are nevertheless examples. They are nevertheless leaders. They set a a standard. They are worthy of respect and admiration. Through the paradigm of going back to that good man versus the real man, we can also understand Paul's standard for young men which kind of jumps out on you on the page by how short it is. Everyone else has a number of characteristics. It seems the the young men, Paul just thinks, uh, I think this one will be enough for you. And it's the same as everyone else, to be self-controlled, to be prudent again. Young men, uh, they have a hard time doing that. Why is that? Well, they have testosterone. They are aggressive. They are driven. If put in the right direction, that's very good, but usually it ends by men becoming the, the real man, a man uh, driven and compelled by his passions, his gut, his anger, his lusts, but the godly young man, he is to suppress that, he is to restrain those desires, those passions, that aggressiveness and that drive through prudence. And again, All of us, though, uh, we we need that drive. We need that aggression. It's good that young men have that. That's how they accomplish things. That's how they do good things in society. But it's also how they can uh, make a wreck of their lives. Uh, Think of it in this way. Young men are blessed with aggressiveness, uh, drive, even sometimes a lack of inhibition. And all of this can be good if it's put in the right direction. Uh, Think of it this way. We used to have these things called gas stoves. You probably don't remember them. Uh, We found out that they were destroying the world, so we got rid of them. But uh, what happened in a gas stove is um, sometimes you would turn on the gas and it functioned like it was supposed to and it would ignite a flame. But usually that wasn't the case. And so you turn it on and the gas would start coming out and you need to get a match ready or a lighter so you can light the stove. Men's drive, their aggressiveness, their testosterone, it's a bit like that gas. If it's given a purpose, if it's focused on something, then it's helpful, it's beneficial. And that's actually the only way you can control it, right? The only way you can control the gas coming into the air is by directing it to something, to keeping a flame going. But if no purpose is given to that gas, if there's no flame, well, eventually it would suffocate the people in the house. Or, even worse, it might happen, well, I guess one way dying is the same as another way dying. Uh, Also, someone could light a match and the whole thing blows up. That's what happens to so many men in our society. They are not given a godly purpose. They have nowhere to direct their energy, their drive, even that ability to do risky behaviors for the good of others, and it ends in disaster. It ends in a blaze of fire. Of course, other men, they do find a purpose in life, but it's an unworthy purpose, vain glory or personal wealth, and that unrelenting, focused pursuit of those destructive things results in much pain as well. So then, what men need is a worthy purpose in order to direct their energies by prudence. What are those worthy purposes? The service of the church and the provision of a family. And it's that focus uh, accompanied by an accumulation of wisdom that's going to let a man be self-controlled. Controlled by prudence, controlled by wisdom. It's going to result in him not being one of these men who wastes their life away, not doing anything not helping anybody, merely having a few fleeting experiences of pleasure. That's no way to live life. The way to live life is to love others, to sacrifice, and that's what men need in order to restrain their drive, restrain their, direct, their aggression, direct it to something fruitful. A good example of this is the Wild West. The Wild West was a place where there were a lot of young men, very few women, so very few families, and not a law of law and order. Was this good for young men? Not at all. They engage in all kinds of violent crimes, risky behavior, 
did not act according to inhibitions. Many of them died young. Many of them did terrible things. Men don't thrive when they're just left on their own and told, do whatever you want. We need responsibility to focus our energy. With that, then, let's, let's turn to discussing women. And, and again, first discussing the plight of women in America by discussing society's vision for women. And again, this description of the futility of the modern vision for women, well, it should be an encouragement to us who know of a better way through Scripture. The plight of women in America is so bad that a Supreme Court justice, one of the smartest of us all, who is herself a woman, she doesn't even know what a woman is. Uh, to answer that great question of our day, what exactly is a woman? I, I like the definition of a, a Catholic writer, Abigail Ryan Favale, in her book, The Genesis of Gender, she, she gave this definition. A woman is the kind of human being whose body is organized according to the potential of gestation and generating within herself. A man, in contrast, is the kind of human being whose body is organized according to the potential to generate outside of himself. And the basic problem for women in our society is that they are told that they can be whatever they want to be. Despite their physical limitations, they can do whatever they want. And that's where the problem is. They're told that the parts of them that make them a woman, that make them feminine, that those are a limitation that are to be overcome. They do not appreciate the beauty and wonder that God has created in a woman, in a female. And fortunately, they say, hey, yeah, listen, women are only going to be happy when they lose all the aspects that make them women and basically become like men. But here's the good news. Through chemicals and through surgery, you can be a man, just like them. And whatever we can't erase through medical means, guess what? We'll just all pretend it's not the case. Yeah, women are just as strong as men. Yeah, they have the exact same interests as men. Yeah, it's just the same. What are you talking about? For all of their talk of the patriarchy, behind all of feminism is a belief that women can only be happy when they no longer are restrained by what makes them a woman. It's nonsensical. Feminists do not value women. They hate women. They have made an idol of manhood, basically. It's not all that great, let me tell you. For young girls, then, on social media, these warped values result in warped role models and expectations that crush their morale. Here are some very sad statistics. A report from the CDC found that almost 60% of U.S. girls said they felt persistently sad or hopeless. More than twice as many girls as boys reported experiencing poor mental health in the past 30 days. 30% 30 of high school girls in America said they were seriously considering suicide, while 13% have already made an attempt on their life, almost twice the rate of boys. How, how could you think that our society knows what a woman ought to be when that's the result? It is inane, it is empty, it is futile, and it is so destructive. And it's so sad. The world simply cannot see they are blind to the beauty and goodness of being a wife and mother. The quiet humility, dignity, and love of motherhood is completely lost on them. And hey, at least they're consistent. For them, all that matters in life is self-expression and the accumulation of pleasurable experiences. And let me tell you, if that's all you care about in life, then sure, manhood is better. That's not, though, what matters in life. Do we not, as Christians, believe that what matters in life, what's truly valuable as personal characteristics, are love, humility, meekness, patience, endurance, the image of God? And if we care about those things, then what could be more noble and beautiful than bearing and raising little image bearers? As a mother, your tireless self-denial, humility, patience, and love well, that'll never be exalted among the many. But among the few, your husband and children, no one will be exalted higher. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Amen. And the woman's role is quite clear here in Titus 2. 
The standard role of a woman is to be a wife, mother, and homemaker. You just can't get around that. The man is told nothing about the household. He's told nothing about raising children. And the woman is told four things. You either agree with the Apostle Paul or you say he's wrong. But what Paul's saying, it's not his ideas. This goes all the way back to Genesis. There, the woman is indeed honored. She is honored in that it is from her womb. It is from her that the serpent will be crushed, that the Messiah will come. It is by her offspring that the serpent's head will be crushed. And then later in that same chapter, chapter 3, the woman is honored with the name Eve, which means the mother of all living. Women are protected in their role of wife, mother, and homemaker, not to oppress them, but to uphold them. The greatest power of humanity is the power to make other humans, to make other image bearers. And of course, men, you know, we do like 1% of that. It's largely up to the women. And as a a caveat, I want to address everyone. The biblical esteem for being a wife, mother, and homemaker does not demean women who are only some of those. Uh, Let me give you um, some historical uh, examples that that exemplify this. In the pre-Christian Roman Empire, there were only three types of women. Women who were about to be married, women who were married, or women who were widowed. There was no such thing as a spinster. There was really no such thing as a woman who never married. And this wasn't just true of ancient Rome. It's true of most societies throughout history. Uh, In most societies, close to 100% of females marry, and usually at young ages. It's another example in traditional China. uh, We have some data there. Only 1% to 2% of women remained unmarried at age 30. It was only with the dawn of Christianity that a new category arose, that of the woman who chooses not to marry in order to devote herself fully to the church. And so Christianity stands in contrast both to pagan Rome and to pagan America. Contrary to Roman society, there is a biblical category of women who never marry in order to dedicate themselves fully to service in the church, a la 1 Corinthians 7. Yet contrary American society... There is no biblical category of women who never marry in order to dedicate themselves to their careers. Further contra-American society, there is no biblical category of women who marry but elect not to have children. Paul commands husbands and wives to give each other their conjugal rights. And in a pre-hormonal birth control world, guess what that means? They're going to have kids. Thus, for Christian women... Your goal in life ought either to become a wife, mother, and homemaker, or sacrifice that high calling in order to serve God's people through the church by being able to be completely dedicated to the church, again, as Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 7. And of course, though, whatever goal you might have for your life, the best laid plans of mice and men off go astray. And so it is. There are many faithful, wonderful women whose goal it is or was to become a wife, mother, and homemaker But in God's providence, they have not. And so some some long for a society like Rome, where every woman was married, where it was a lot easier. Some, on the other hand, are unable to have children. Some are widowed. Yet in such cases, your purpose is not lost. Rather, the Lord has provided you either a temporary or permanent station to serve the church. And of course, uh, being single, you'll need money to survive in that case. And so it is good for you to have a career and do well in it and serve others in that career. And the basic point applies to every person, male, female, young, old, married, single, whatever. Your purpose in life is to serve others, to love. It's not to fulfill yourself. It's not to realize your true self deep down inside. It's to love and serve like Christ. And whatever your lot, your station in life, that's what you need to dedicate yourself to. Let's now look particularly at the roles for women, uh, for older women and then younger women. Uh, Older women are basically those who are past the throes of motherhood, and younger women are those who are not children anymore and are therefore in the throes of motherhood. Uh, The first thing that it said about older women there in verse 3 is that they are to be reverent in behavior. That was a unique term usually used to describe priestesses. So basically it means uh, an older woman should conduct herself as a, a daughter of God, someone who has a special and holy calling. 
Next, I think Paul basically says that older women ought to avoid the temptations of being a, an empty nester. They are to be not slanderers or slaves to much wine. It's an interesting thing. If a woman spends her whole life taking care of children, raising them, and then all of a sudden that huge responsibility is no longer there. So some women, they can end up filling that void in their life by becoming busybodies, getting involved with everyone's business, and then gossiping and slandering people. They also, being at home all day and perhaps feeling a bit empty and purposeless, can resort to alcoholism. Older women are to resist those temptations. They are not to spend their time that way. Instead, they are to spend their time teaching and training the young women, giving them prudence and wisdom of how they are to be godly women. They are to teach them how to be good. Paul, in this section, he basically has a plan for everybody in every station of of the church. He has a plan for the elders, he has a plan for the older men, for the young men, for the older women, for the young, younger women, and then for the, the children as well. The young women are the ones who love the children. And within all those categories too, there's also a, a structure, a, a design that Paul has so that everyone will be taught and trained. Titus, uh, and the el- Titus teaches the elders, and the elders and Titus teach the older men and the younger men and the older women. It, however, is not the prerogative of the elders to train the young women. That falls to the older women. That is your role in the church. And, and you need to do it if you're not doing it. You know, the elders don't know how to be a mom. The elders don't know how to love a husband. We need the older women teaching the younger women how to do that. And so what specifically are the younger women told to do? First of all, they're, they're said to love their husbands. What does it mean to love your husband? I don't know. I've never done it. You need to ask an older woman, what does it mean to love your husband? What are the temptations? What things am I blind to? How can I serve him better? I did think a little bit about, well, biblically, who, what's an example of, of women loving their husband? What's an example of women not loving their husband? Uh, the, the best positive example I thought of was Ruth, who depends on Boaz who trusts in him, who honors him. When, when Boaz says, yes, yes, I want to marry you, but I got a plan and it's kind of complicated, let me go do it. You know, uh, my, my wife said that they left our, they, what really happened is Ruth went, well, you got a plan? Tell me about it. When are you going to go? Are you going to go tonight, tomorrow? Are you sure? You want to bring a jacket? Do you want me to come with you? Okay, I'll stay back. Are you going to go now? Uh, yeah, she, she thought that was going to be too long, so they just deleted it and they just act like Ruth. Yeah, oh yeah, that's great. Go ahead. On the other hand, biblically, women don't love their husbands when they coerce and control them. And they absolutely can. Just women control and coerce men differently than men the other way. I'll listen to this quote from John Piper. If you have any doubts about the power of sinful woman to control sinful man, just reflect for a moment on the number one marketing force in the world, the female body. She can sell anything because she knows the universal weakness of man and how to control him with it. The exploitation of women by sinful men is conspicuous because it is often harsh and violent. But a woman's re- a moment's reflection will show you that the exploitation of men by sinful women is just as pervasive in our society. The difference is that our sinful society sanctions the one perversity and not the other. One particular way I see women controlling their husbands is that men are scared of their wives. They are scared of their wives' disapproval, their passive aggression, their nagging, their emotional withdrawal. So they do whatever they can not to upset their wives. Wives, you you know how to influence your husbands. You know how you control them, direct them. Don't abuse that. Use the influence that you absolutely have on them to encourage them to God's standard rather than your own. And trust them. Let them be able to make decisions knowing that you are their supporter and not their judge. Next, young women are told to love their children. Again, how do you be a mom? Ask the older women. I've never done it. Well, I've loved my kids not as a mom, though. Uh, and again, Paul's paradigm, the children, they're accounted for by their mothers loving them. What does it mean to love? Well, you know, to love is to value someone's good above your own. It's easy as parents to mistake admiration, thinking our kids are cute, 
caring about their welfare, for true love, where we put their good and we plan and we act for their, indeed, not just uh, immediate good, but their long-term good. And of course, that good only comes about through discipline. You can't truly love your kids just by pacifying them. You don't love your kids by living vicariously through their successes. You love them by teaching and training them to love and know Christ and be like him. Next, the women are told to be self-controlled. Again, that's, that's a word better understood as prudent. I'll talk about that more next time. The women are told to be chaste. Uh, that, that basically means uh, sexually pure. Again, ask the older women what that means. All I'd say is recognize that female impurity is expressed differently than male impurity. Next, we have what's translated in the, the ESV as saying working at home. Um, it really, though, just means homemaker. Uh, here's what one commentator said. It is a sign of the political correctness of the modern age that this word is no longer readily used or even understood. The ESV translates it as working at home as opposed to working in the office. And the NIV says that they should be busy at home, which is closer to the original sense, but still not altogether clear. The meaning, however, is perfectly clear. Uh, women had to learn to keep a good house so that the many duties of hospitality that were incumbent on ancient families could be carried out properly. Paul the Apostle says that the women are to be trained to take care of their homes. The men are not told to do this. The upkeep of the house is the woman's domain in Paul's description. But you can't take this too far and say that's her only domain. That's not what the word means is she only works at home. It doesn't mean that she can't possibly do anything outside of the house. In fact, in many cases, including my own, the wife working outside the home is a part of her taking care of the home by providing important income. This is especially the case for many families of us who are here in the land of the paradise tax. And uh, this also certainly does not mean that the husband should lie on the couch while the wife slaves away. It is the husband's prerogative in life to care for his wife as his own flesh, to lay down his life for her. And so the husband who is being faithful to his role in God's economy is going to help and support his wife as best he can according to the other responsibilities he has in life. The next word there is translated kind. Really, it's just the word good. A good way to understand it would be virtuous. And then finally, women are to be submissive to their husbands. To be submissive means that the wife puts herself under her husband's guidance and direction. This is how she loves her husband. A, love, a, a woman loves her husband differently than a husband loves his wife. Most basically, the husband lovingly gives and the wife lovingly receives. The husband lovingly gives his time, energy, and direction and the woman loves him by receiving that from him. And though submission is commanded for wives, submission is beautiful and that is voluntary. So submission is both mandatory for wives, but it, it also finds its dignity, its glory, and that it is an expression of the will. That the wife is willingly letting her husband be the one who takes care of her, who directs her and guides her. No other man is doing that in her life. It's only the one particular man she has chosen that she allows to lead him, and that indeed is an expression of her will, an expression of her love. And again, for a people that values love, humility, meekness, and patience, what could be more beautiful than that? Finally, in conclusion, very briefly, family life is difficult. There are no perfect families. The ones that seem that way are only superficially so. No one does this perfectly. It be quite hard. And even for those who dedicate themselves to the biblical model, it's long, grueling work. It's often boring, certainly not glorious in the eyes of the world, but it's worth it. It's what makes a lasting impact. You train up other people to be image bearers of God, to follow Christ, to reflect him. That is significant. That is lasting. That is meaningful work. Let's ask that the Lord would help us in that. Dear Lord, we thank you for telling us how we are to be as men, how we are to be as women. And we confess that this is hard for us. We are sinners and we don't want to follow it. And furthermore, Lord, we are foolish and we deceive ourselves. And all around us are bad examples. So please, Lord, help us. Please make it clear what it would mean for us as individuals to be faithful to your model. Convict us of the ways that we deviate from it. And for anyone, Lord, who has a hard time submitting to your design, please help them. Give them grace to see the beauty and goodness of it. Please bless us in it. In your son's name we pray. Amen. If you'd now stand for the benediction.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.